in the book of 2 Chronicles this evening, 2 Chronicles chapter number 26. I am thankful for another opportunity to get to preach and just want to reiterate uh, our thanks again for everyone that's been listening in and uh, you've been tuning in. We sure appreciate that. And, you know, I was thinking if you have trouble staying awake here in the church house, I don't even want to know what it's like for you to try to stay awake in the comfort of your own house. So uh, grab some coffee or something if you need it while I preach. Second Chronicles chapter number 26, and we're going to read the first five verses. Beginning there in verse 1 of Second Chronicles 26, the Bible says, Then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the room of his father Amaziah. He built Eloth and restored it to Judah. After that, the king slept with his fathers. Sixteen years old was Uzziah when he began to reign, and he reigned fifty and two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Jechaliah of Jerusalem, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah did. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. Now there are two phrases, and they're both very similar, that I want you to notice in verse number 5 of this text. The Bible says that the nation under this young man, this 16-year-old king, was a blessed nation. The hand of God was on the nation. The blessings of God were flowing. And the key to the prosperity they enjoyed is found in a characteristic of Uzziah's life. It's mentioned twice in verse 5, and here's the phrase. The Bible says, he sought God, and then at the end of the verse, it makes the statement again. It says, he sought the Lord. So there's a connection here between this young man who sought God and the blessings of God upon the nation. There's a connection here between a king who sought after righteousness and the blessings of God being poured out upon his generation. For a little while, I'm going to preach a simple, very simple, straightforward message on this thought, seeking God in this generation. If God used that man then to seek after God, and in return, God blessed the nation, then don't you think God would smile on a church, a nation, a family, a youth group, or just an individual that would seek the Lord in this generation? We need a seeker. For the sake of this generation, I'm praying that whether you're 16 or you're 60 years old, you'd allow God to speak to your heart tonight and just decide, I'm going to enlist to be a seeker after God for such a time as this. Let's pray together and then we'll get into the message. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity. And uh, Father, I, I just want to thank you for being such a good God. Lord, thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for supplying my needs. and uh, Lord, I, I don't have anything to say of, uh, to these folks in and of myself that, that's worth any value. And Lord, I pray you'd take my frail words and lips and I pray that uh, you'd use them, Lord, to speak to hearts. I pray the truth of your word would find a lodging place in our hearts. Lord, this isn't going to be something deep or something profound. Lord, it's just going to be a simple truth, but I pray it would challenge us. And I pray that you convict us and that you do with it what you see fit. We love you. We ask for your presence these next few moments. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In the year 1872 in London, there was a, a woman by the name of Mary Ann Adler. Mary Ann Adler was bedridden because of illness. She was unable to attend services at her church, but she did resolve to pray every day that God would send revival to her church. Mary Ann Adler regularly received a publication that was entitled Revival. That was the name of it. She was reading that paper, and it mentioned a preacher by the name of D.L. Moody. She did not know D.L. Moody, and she never met D.L. Moody. But she began to pray that this American preacher would come to her town there outside of London and preach at her church, and that God might send revival to her people. She began to earnestly pray. Now, it just so happened that D.L. Moody decided to take a vacation in Europe. It just so happened. And it just so happened that D.L. Moody decided to visit London of all places. It just so happened. And it just so happened that D.L. Moody decided to attend the church that was the home church of a lady by the name of Mary Ann Adler, even though she could not attend. 
D.L. Moody walked in uh, unexpected and unannounced. He sat there in the pew and the pastor saw him and he asked D.L. Moody to come up and preach impromptu that day there in the service. D.L. Moody, uh, it just happenstance, you know, it's not like God was in it or anything, but D.L. Moody just happened to get in the pulpit and preach that day, and many church members were saved by the grace of God, and a meeting began, and it took off, and over 400 new members uh, were added to that church in the following weeks because a great revival took place. D.L. Moody said that it intrigued him. He'd never seen anything quite like that before, and so he began to acquire he began to try to find out the reason that all of this had happened. And his search, he said it took him to a little house in a little bedroom where a little lady who was bedfast was praying and seeking God for revival in her church. Can I say we need a Mary Ann Adler in this generation? Let me pause right here and say, I'm glad tonight that God sought for me. Amen. Uh, there was a time like Saul of Tarsus when I was lost in sin and thank God he sought for me. Just like the maniac of Gadara, I was in bondage to sin, but thank God he sought for me. Uh, like Lazarus, I was dead in trespasses and sins, but thank God he sought for me. The hymn says, Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, bought me with his precious blood. God the Father created man and then sought to fellowship with him. God the Son died for sinners and then seeks to save sinners. Oh, God the Holy Spirit indwells believers and then seeks to conform us to the image of Christ. Can I say tonight that our God is a seeker? Our Savior is a seeker. The Holy Spirit is a seeker. And I'm convinced tonight that God smiles upon, God blesses, and God will use someone who diligently follows his example and earnestly seeks after God. Hebrews 11:6 6 says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You know, we would have no heroes in, in Hebrews chapter 11 to read about had, had, some, uh, had we not had some men and women who followed the principle put forth in Hebrews eleven six, 6, and they determined by faith to diligently seek after God. Can I say Noah was a seeker? Enoch was was a seeker. Abraham was a seeker. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And in this era of Christianity where it seems like the average Christian is, is wrapped up in seeking dollars and they're caught up in, in seeking comfort and they're at ease in the world and just, just kind of biding time till Jesus comes. Can I say I believe it's time that we had a young man or maybe a young lady or, or a mother or a father or just a saved individual that would get hungry and get a desire and get a burden to earnestly seek after the Lord. We need a Mary Ann Adler in this generation. We need an Abraham in this generation. We need an Enoch in our generation. We need a Noah in our generation. We need someone to get a hunger tonight to earnestly thirst and seek after God. Let me say this, pride is a poisonous thing. Pride will cripple the Christian life. The most sincere motives are tainted by pride. Whenever we consider the life of Uzziah, sadly, when we go to the end of his life, uh, we see a testimony of just how terrible pride can be in a person's life. Uzziah was a man who was blessed, but he'll be broken by his pride. He was a promoter of righteousness, but he will fall into sin because of pride. As a young man, he sought after God, but because of pride, he will overstep the boundaries of God and he will find himself coming down with leprosy. What a lesson it is for us that you and I ought to quickly snuff out any flame of pride that begins to burn and blaze in our heart. Oh, Uzziah was blessed by God. Uh, the Bible says he had grown very strong in verse 16. And because of his prosperity, pride rises up in his life. At the end of his life, Uzziah goes to the temple. He enters into an area that was off limits to him. 
Now, Uzziah is a king, but uh, he's not a priest. He has rights to the throne, but not to the holy place. And Uzziah decides to take incense and burn it upon the altar, and he doesn't care what God had said. He's so full of pride and so full of himself. He enters into the holy place, and as he does, I'm glad that the high priest speaks up and 80 other men of God with him, and they stand against the king. They tell the king that that altar is not yours. That is set aside for those consecrated to the service of the priesthood. Uzziah is so filled with pride, he doesn't listen to the preacher. And he stretches out his hand, and when he does, the Bible says he's stricken with leprosy in his forehead. Can I say that is a very strong warning to you and I? There's no place for pride in the Christian life. Can I say you and I, at our best, we are just sinners saved by the grace of God. It doesn't matter who you are or what you own or what your social status is. You and I are just sinners saved by God's grace. And I am what I am, not because of what I've done or who I am, but because of God and His goodness and His mercy and His grace in my life. Uzziah might have ended wrong, but I'm glad he started well. And there's a statement made at the beginning of his life that I think can be a help and a blessing and a challenge to us. Uzziah took the throne at a very young age. Now, can you imagine, just, just stop and imagine the weight uh, that is now laid upon his shoulders. This young man, he's 16 years old. He has to make all the day-to-day -day, uh, decisions for his nation. He has to determine policy and the direction of his people. He has to meet all these various needs, and he's just a teenager. You know, he was crowned before he'd be even old enough to vote or drive by himself in our country today. You know, most 16-year-olds of today, they don't even make their bed, hello. Think about it. Uzziah didn't have much experience. He did not have much training. He hadn't led uh, a wife or a family. He hadn't led people, let alone a nation, and now he's placed on the throne. Hey, moms and dads, can you imagine your 16-year-old becoming the, the king of the country that you are living in? I mean, who knows? Maybe they'd run it better than, than some of the politicians we have in Washington. Say amen right there. You can write them in next time you vote. But what I like about Uzziah is this. In spite of all the difficulties, in spite of all the odds stacked against him, the Bible says the nation prospered and even had a season of revival under the reign of King Uzziah, a 16-year-old king. 16 years old and the nation was strengthened. 16 years old and the enemies were subdued. 16 years old and God blessed he wasn't a mighty man of war. He wasn't a wise old prophet. He wasn't a seasoned soldier. He was simply a young man that set his heart to diligently seek after God. I believe that's the key. It's mentioned twice in verse 5 where it says he sought God and then again he sought the Lord. Now that kind of sounds out of character for a teenager, doesn't it? That doesn't fit the box of this generation. It's sort of strange for a young man. But can I say, Uzziah was not the expected. Thank God, he was the exception. He did not have enough understanding to rule. So what did he do? He sought the one who has all wisdom. He, he did not have enough power to rule. So what did he do? He sought the one who has all power. Oh, he wasn't old enough to really have a sense of direction in life. So he sought the one who's from everlasting to everlasting. He took the throne, but he didn't stick power or popularity or position. Uzziah simply sought God. And the Bible records for us when he sought God, God made him to prosper. And by the way, let me say this. If you read your Bible real close, you'll find that he sought the same God his father sought. He didn't seek a new God. He didn't seek a, a hip God. He didn't seek a God that he had manipulated and, and made to his own liking and brought down to his level so he could buddy up with him and feel comfortable with his sin. Oh, he didn't seek a God who fit in with the culture. And he, didn't, he sought the same God his daddy sought. And can I call a time out and say the God of the generations before us, 
is still the same today. He's still God and He's still holy. Uh, that's still true in our generation. That will never change. We don't have to seek after some new marketed, manufactured God that's based upon the opinion of the trends and the cultures of today. But the God of the Bible, the God of our forefathers that was good enough for them, He's still plenty good enough for us today in 2020. The God who has sent revival is still good enough today. The God who has saved is still good enough today. The God who gave us the Bible, amen, he's still good enough today. In fact, I'd say he's more than enough still today. Now, no doubt, the tendency of a young man in a prominent position like a king would be to seek after things and do things that might hurt his reputation. But not Uzziah. Uzziah sought God. He wanted God's counsel. He knew he had to have God's power. He needed God's direction and God's wisdom. He sought the Lord. Now let me apply this. Today, you and I, we live in a nation in desperate need of revival. And that's not just a cliche. That is a truth. For you not to agree with that would mean that you don't have an internet connection or television or common sense. Without question tonight, we live in a country that is in desperate need. The theme of the preaching all across the pulpits of this land right now is this. America better wake up to her need of revival. Our nation's in desperate need. Our nation's primary need is not a physical one, although there are those who have physical needs. Our nation's primary need is not a social one, although our society could be better. But rather, America's primary need is a spiritual awakening that comes through Christians seeking after their God. Our nation's in desperate need when a lawmaker would legislate that we can kill babies after they're born. And those wicked, corrupt politicians will stand there and applaud it like it was some heroic action. Oh, we're in desperate need. I, I read an article the other day about a pastor in China who was put in jail for nine years because he would not quit preaching the gospel. You say, oh, well, that's over there, Brother Corey. Yeah, but that'll be over here real soon. Real soon. You know, one of these days in the future, you may have to come visit me in jail for preaching this book right here. Folks, we're one election away from that kind of stuff happening right here in the good old United States of America. Our nation's in a mess. They, they legislate that which is abominable. And now you, you preach on that stuff in a Bible-believing church. And the atmosphere kind of tends just to get a little tight. Our kids are being indoctrinated in schools and colleges. People are being taught to openly accept sin through the TV and, and Hollywood and perversity is being pushed and corruption is celebrated. And meanwhile, our churches are just a handful of people away from closing. Sometimes, you know, we get so frustrated with that younger generation uh, for not wanting to be in church and, and not wanting to be associated with the things of God. But can I say, the average church you go to in America, you'd have to be crazy to want to go to that place. You say, what do you mean by that, Brother Corey? Uh, I'm saying it's deader than a hammer. The Bibles are dust covered and, and the people go there and it's like they're having a funeral for Jesus every service. Can I say I wouldn't want to go there either? That's where we're at in America. We desperately need somebody to get a hunger, to get a burden, to break out of status quo and business as usual and be like every other dead church out there and say, if nobody else will, for the sake of my generation, I will seek after God. We've not even seen what God can do. We've not even seen what God wants to do. Can I say my heart breaks tonight for my nation? My heart burns tonight for our nation. Can God do for us what he's done for others? What he's done in past generations? Sure he can. But someone's going to have to seek after him. Can I say it doesn't matter your IQ, your background. It doesn't matter your age. There is no telling what God might do through you if you seek him. When you look in the Bible, you'll find that seekers have been shepherds. Seekers have been soldiers. Seekers have been prophets and priests and kings and common people. It doesn't take someone special to be a seeker. You know, I think about David. David didn't seek to kill Goliath. He was seeking God, and God opened the door for him to kill the giant. 
Noah didn't seek to build an ark. He was seeking God, and God opened the door for him to build the biggest boat that had ever been built at that time. Daniel didn't seek to have to pray in the lion's den. He was seeking God and allowed God to show himself mighty on Daniel's behalf. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't seek to walk in a fiery furnace. They were seeking God and God gave them opportunity to see that God will walk with you in the fire. Peter didn't seek to preach on the day of Pentecost. He was seeking God and God opened the door for him to preach that great revival meeting. And can I say if you seek God, and I see God, and we see God as a church. What might God do? Think about the doors He would open if we would get hungry and seek after Him. I've been reading lately about a famous preacher named Jonathan Edwards. Many of you know about him. We know how he preached that famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. If you've never read it, I encourage you to read it sometime. And the Great Awakening was sparked by that message there in New England. And for three days and three nights before he preached, I didn't know this till I read it, for three days and three nights before he preached, he was alone in his prayer closet, fasting, begging God and seeking God. And he prayed and said, Lord, if I would give you Jonathan Edwards, would you give me New England? Well, what happened? He got in the pulpit and preached and God took Jonathan Edwards and gave him New England in return. Why? Because he sought after God. Let me ask you something. For the sake of those lost in our generation, would you seek God? For the sake of those who are hurting in our generation, would you be a seeker? For the sake of those in bondage to sin in our generation, would you be a seeker? For the sake of those who are discouraged, would you be a seeker? For the sake of our church, in our city, in our state, in our country, would you be a seeker? God's not looking for the next big name preacher. We're not talking about the next great singer. We're not talking about the next this, that, or the other. God's interested in somebody who will humble themselves and hunger after him and say, Lord, I just want you. Many times I'm afraid that, that we pray just seeking answers, and I'm guilty of that. God wants us to pray seeking Him. I'm afraid we go to church when we have the opportunity and maybe we're seeking entertainment or we're seeking friendship, but we ought to go seeking Him. Many times I believe we serve because we're seeking results when we ought to serve because we're seeking Him. Some people, uh, they stay spiritually clean because they're seeking His power, but we ought to stay clean spiritually seeking after Him. Some sing because they're seeking an applause, we ought to sing because we're seeking Him. When I preach, I don't want to preach just seeking a response. I want to preach seeking Him. I don't want to listen to preaching for any other reason than the fact that I am seeking after the Lord. I don't want to fall into that crowd like Paul said, all men seek their own and not the things of Christ. I don't care about fame and fortune. So much as I know I need God in my life. My family needs God. My marriage needs God. My church needs to see God manifest himself. You teenagers, you need to see God move. And how's that going to happen? You and I are going to have to seek after God. I'm saying God and his word and his house will have to become the focal point of our life. In Philippians 3.10, Paul writes these words. He says that I may know him. Hey, Paul, what do you want, Paul? I mean, after, after three and a half decades of preaching and, and 35 years or so in the ministry, what is it that you'd like to have? What is it that you really want? Here's what Paul said, that I may know him. One preacher put it this way, if Jesus were the atmosphere, I'd breathe in as much as I could. If Jesus were the banquet table before me, I'd eat everything on the table, and sometimes I do anyway, amen. If Jesus were the ocean, I'd dive to the bottom. If Jesus were a garment, I'd wrap myself from head to foot in it. More, more about Jesus, that's what I want. One writer said it this way, it's one thing to know that God is, but it's another thing to know the God that is. I want to know more of the God that is. 
Seek God early. The Bible says if we seek him early, we'll find him. Seek him diligently. Let me tell you this true story, and then we're done. Sometime before this pandemic began, the president of Argentina was talking to an American ambassador. And that ambassador said to him, he asked him, he said, you know, our nation has been so blessed, and it seems like South America is struggling. What do you think the difference is? And without hesitation, the president of Argentina said, South America was founded by soldiers seeking gold. North America was founded by pilgrims seeking God. Why does God bless a church? Why does God send revival? Why does God use a life? Because somewhere along the way, someone drove a stake of resolve in the ground and determined, I am going to seek after God. Are you actively seeking after God? I'm not talking about going through the, the motions of church membership. I'm asking, is he the primary focus of your life? For the sake of this generation, I, I hope and pray that he is. We need a seeker. We need a seeker in this generation. Past generations have had them. And we have what we have today because of it. But where are the seekers for today? Where are they at? Let's seek God's face together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the challenge that you've given to us through it. Lord, I do pray for a spiritual awakening. Lord, not just in uh, my own life, but in the life of this church and certainly in the life of this nation. And Father, we, as best we know how, we just humble ourselves before you. We ask that you'd forgive us of our sins and that you'd cleanse us. And Lord, I, I pray that in the days ahead, Lord, that you'd help us to do more for you, to be closer to you, and Lord, that we could see greater days ahead for the glory of God. That's our desire. And so, Father, I pray that uh, this message has been a help and been a challenge to those that will hear it. We love you, and we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We ask these things in his name.